Guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath, and I am joined by C. Courtney Joyner. You know him as a, you are, there, say say hi, Courtney, so the camera cuts. Hi, yes, yeah, so we can get, yes, my audio is here. We're in the middle of a deep discussion about all kinds of stuff, but first of all, let me, so people will know you, for, you are a, you're a writer, you're a director, you're a producer, you're a, an author, a novelist, you're, I mean, so much stuff. You're also popping up on tons and tons of discs as, you know, the, the expert commentator, the behind the scenes special feature. You were in the middle of telling me a story. I'm just going to pick it up where you left off. Okay. Well, we, you know, we were talking about kind of the myths around a lot of genre movies. <laughs> and uh, we were talking specifically about how close Lon Chaney was to Dracula. And, you know, there, there's really some suspect there. But I'll give you a, a classic one that just some people just hold on to with a death grip. In the 1960s, there's a book called Science Fiction uh, Cinema. It was written by a British author named John Baxter. And he, it was very, it was a, it was a huge selling paperback. It was part of a series of, of movie books. And he was one of the big proponents of Jack Arnold. One of the first really guys to examine Jack Arnold and his themes and all that and all the, uh, you know, science fiction movies he made at Universal in the 50s. Okay. He put forth this idea that Jack Arnold came in and redirected sections of this island Earth. So, you know, as they say that the Metaluna mutant stuff was added after the fact and that Jack Arnold, no, 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 never happened. And uh, when I got out of college, I went to work at Universal and my boss there was Virgil Vogel. And, you know, Virgil was at that point a huge television director, but of course he had been the editor of This Island Earth and also Touch of Evil and a lot of other great movies. And uh, I had lunch with Jack Arnold and Virgil and I brought this up and they were like, no, uh-uh. It was all Joe Newman. And Jack Arnold, actually Jack said, that he even asked about this so many times that this one little nugget of whatever rumor or what have you had just exploded. And because Jack's own status, because of Creature and it came from outer space and Tarantula and everything, uh, and even later things like, uh, you know, the space children, that suddenly everyone just assumed that Jack's involvement in the movie was just this, this great thing, when in fact his involvement in the movie was zero. Wow. It's but so boy, crazy to see how... Go, go ahead. No, no, you're right. I mean, once these things get going and now right. with, you know, with boards and blogs and all that type of stuff, man, it just, it goes out into the world and mutates, uh, you know, into something that, uh, you know, I was is gonna never going to crazy away, how fan rumor can become presented. It just gets taken for granted as a fact. And then it gets put on a blog somewhere and someone reads the blog and they're like, well, it, it's, it's on the internet. It must be true. It so, must be true. Exactly. Yeah. That's fascinating. And... To the viewer. So when I, so I, I, I hit, okay, we, we started the meeting and see Courtney Joyner is just like, he just launches into stories. He's like, and then I was talking to so-and-so. It's amazing. It's like the guy that you see and the behind the scenes features, like who's like the expert. I've, I've got a stack of, I've got a stack of you here. I've got the, so oh, when, when, um, when we're talking about, you know, when you're talking about, you know, hammer, certain hammer movies and stuff, this is who you are like 24 seven. You just like, you have this knowledge. It's, there are no notes. You're just like, boom. And in 1952, boom, it's amazing. I'm so envious. <laughs> well, well, thank you for, for, for the extreme compliments. You, you might want to discuss this with uh, my friends, my ex-wife to see yeah, how amazing <laughs> it really is, uh, you know, not just obnoxious. I want to ask you about something you brought up after college. You're a USC alumni, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, did you go through the cinematic arts program? No, um, I graduated in 1982. Uh, and at that time, the cinema school, they had an undergrad program. And the head of the department at the time did offer me, finally, I was very close to graduation, if I wanted to switch from English to uh, actually history criticism. But production was uh, very hard to get in. Now, Jeff Burr, who's one of my best friends, Jeff got into production, but generally that was for grad students. 
So I was there when Kevin Reynolds and those guys were there. Mm-hmm. And um, they were uh, they were getting their their graduate degrees and I was an undergrad. And when when finally the opera because I was running around and helping out and you know doing what I could do and being a general pain to everybody. Uh, but when when I did have the chance to switch over to history criticism, I was already so far down the road with the other degree. I just said, no, I just stuck to the English degree. And that was that was it. But they changed a lot of the rules of acceptance and everything else in the cinema department, because when I was there, as was Jeff and, and Kevin and all when we were all there, Dan Golden and, you know, all of us, uh, it was still the old stables with John Milius, you know, having scratch reality ends here above the door and all that was still there. That's where we were. Then all of that was taken down and they saved bits and pieces and they rebuilt it into this kind of, you know, gorgeous, you know, mosque that they have now for the cinema department. But that's not what it, that's not what it was. We were, we were in the old building. So as a movie fan, a lifelong movie fan, um, you would have been well aware of the legacy of that school and the people that came out of it, right? George Lucas, Millie. Oh, sure. Because going to high school in the 70s and, you know, movies were changing. Of course, that was such an unbelievable uh, decade. But every time you picked up Time Magazine, they, you know, it was Martin Scorsese or, you know, Brian De Palma or somebody like that on the cover. And you were just inundated with this is the, the this new generation of filmmakers who are creating these incredible works of art and also just great movies. They weren't pretentious, you know, things. And um, there was very much, there was the NYU group and there was the USC group. And the USC group was Lucas and Milius and those guys. And the thing was, I was so focused on USC uh, really for two reasons, but the primary one is because it was in Los Angeles. You were in the heart of where everything was going on. And then all those guys who came out of SC, including John Carpenter, and those, you know, that was that was the next thing that, you know, you got excited about because uh, uh, SC always, even then, seemed to be the place where you were trained to make Hollywood movies, whereas NYU still seemed like the school that was focused on documentary. Yeah. It makes sense. At least in those days, that was the reputation. So take us just a little bit through, how did you go from, you know, a graduate of USC into a writer? Do you do a little bit of a biographical thing here and you just lead us up to how you became a writer? And then well, I was like- always, yeah, I mean, I was always trying to write scripts. My, my mother was a newspaper woman and my, my father uh, was a physician who wrote, uh, wrote a number of textbooks during his medical career. And so I was kind of around that stuff. And um, uh, in fact, my, one of my father's very best friends was the editor of Esquire magazine. So, you know, that was neat. And I was kind of, you know, uh, uh, got, got a little taste of that, at least because I got to talk to, to uh, Harold Hayes. But what happened was um, it was really, it was simultaneous because I was pursuing a biography of Rondo Hatton when I was at USC. A friend of mine had suggested it and I started to write a script, I had no idea. And I was I, I hadn't graduated from college yet. And I was looking for someone who would work with Jack Pierce. And so, uh, and by, at that time, I knew David DelVal even then before I had graduated from college because he was good friends with a friend of mine. And David knew Gail Sondergaard and Martin Koslick. So he got them on the phone with me. So I asked them questions about Rondo Hatton, you know, and of course, Martin Koslick, Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, but uh, I was, I called the head of makeup at, at Universal, a man named Nick Marcellino. Very nice guy. And he is suddenly, he's like, and I had done my research and stuff. And he says to me, are you working on this project with Virgil Vogel? And I was like, the director of the mole people what are you getting and, and he laughed he said well actually he's the director of magnum pi but yeah that's who that's who i mean <laughs> are you working with virgil and i said no and he said well you should call him and i did and it turned out that virgil was in fact working uh on a television movie with a proposal for a tv movie about the life of rondo hatton and so 
I called Virgil and he invited me to have lunch with him the next day at Universal. And I ran over there. Oh, it was so much fun. And this was the thing. I had collected a, a few things about Hatton that he had not seen, including his death certificate. And I took that with me and he's looking at all this stuff. Now, Fred Olin Ray had already written an unbelievably exhaustive uh, article about Rondo Hatton. I think it was for Film Facts. I, I honestly can't remember. But, you know, Fred was a real expert because Rondo Hatton was from Flo Florida, as was Fred. And so anyway, we I kind of let Virgil know about all this stuff. And he said, well, listen, I'm working with a writer named Robert Heverly, who is, uh, you know, going to write this thing. You need to talk to Bob. I did. Bob said, let me read something you've written. I gave him a script I had written. And Bob called me up and said, how would you feel about co-writing this with me? Now, of course, this was all on spec, but I just couldn't believe it because Bob Heverly had been Sam Peckinpah's writing partner on The Westerner in the 1950s. So I was like, oh, my gosh. And boy, did I learn. Bob was a tough teacher. It was it really was, even though I wasn't getting paid, it really was being in the trenches. And he was he was the real deal, but a great guy. And unfortunately, that project was called Hollywood Strangest Love Story. Uh, was never made, but that's how I got involved with Virgil. And when I graduated from college, he asked me to come to Universal and I became kind of his secret uh, rewrite man on his episodics. And I would go through scripts with him and we would do some repairs. So, and I would be bouncing from episodes of, you know, Airwolf to Street Hawk to, you know, whatever it was that uh, he was doing. And, uh, and it was terrific. I, I, it was just like going to the greatest school every single day. Isn't and it at the same time, Jeff and his brother and Darren Scott were putting together the money for the offspring and we were all living together. And that was whispered to a screen. Let me hold it up again so I can, I mean, I could, I could put in just the cutaway, but it's easier to hold it up. I, I have a second, yeah, I'm gonna hold it up to my HD camera. Yep. And inside it has the original title as well. So there you go. That's yep. fascinating. Isn't it interesting how, and by the way, uh, outstanding uh, special features on this featuring, um, Daniel did these, didn't he? It's, it's Dan here, Griffith right? sure yeah. did. He did a, he and Jeff collaborated on that and they just did a fantastic job. Isn't it interesting how so many of the, the movie directors of, and I want to talk to you about this too, just the, that 40s, 50s genre movie boom that we, some of us revere it. Some of us have yet to discover it, but so many of those directors when they go into TV, you're talking about Jack Arnold. I mean, Gilligan's Island, right? Didn't he do episodes? Yep. Of, he it, sure it's, did. it's fascinating. And I guess, I mean, it, it was paying work and it kept them, you know, kept food on the table and it kept them, it kept their skills sharp. You know, I was one of these guys. I was always writing letters to when I was in high school. And in fact, I have a magnificent letter. This was, I started correspondence with Don Siegel when I was about 15 years old. And I actually had the temerity to ask him for a summer job once. Wow. And I have this letter from him. It's just great. I wish I had it with it. I had to hold it up. Don uh, sent me back this note saying, okay, it was on, first of all, it was on telephone stationery. So it was already very cool. Okay. So second of all, he thanked me because I love the shooters so much. And he thanked me for my kind words about the shooters. Then he told me, he says, I'm preparing a new movie with Steve McQueen. And Steve has such a large entourage, I'm afraid there won't be room for you. So Don Siegel is literally telling me Steve McQueen won't allow him to give me a summer job. I mean, that's like the coolest yeah. rejection of all time. You know, <laughs> I mean, oh my God. And the movie was I, Tom Horn, which of course Siegel very famously quit with William Goldman and it's outlined in William Goldman's uh you know book. I'm gonna take and, every one uh, of these I'm gonna take every one of these promotional opportunities that you give me. You're featured on this new uh, essential film noir collection too. I said noir very noir. Uh you talk about Don Siegel. I mean this is basically your uh retrospective of Don Siegel in the 1950s. So if anybody out there is wanting to hear more of you talk about Mr. Siegel, you cut loose on this. I mean, it is, it's a trip to school. 
Oh, well, thank you. He was such a nice man. And, you know, I was so lucky because, and my friends, we've discussed this quite a bit that, you know, coming along as we did and, and reaching Hollywood in the early 80s and whatever, um, so many people who made the movies that we loved and were influenced by, you know, whether it was Robert Aldrich or Sam Peckinpah or Stanley Donan or whoever. First of all, a lot of these guys were around USC. I mean, Gil, King Vidor, Mervyn Leroy used to come down and lecture. I mean, you know, it was just incredible. But also uh, Robert Wise and people like that, their attitude was not at all haughty. And I found that just fascinating because they, this was at a time where they did not consider themselves celebrities. They were wealthy, of course, because they had very successful Hollywood careers. They worked with famous people, but did not consider themselves famous. So that added bit of ego or whatever it was, was, was never there. And I always, everybody was always that I met was so appreciative. It could be like, you know, legends, you know, Fred Zinneman or someone like that. Oh my gosh. And they'd sit and go, Oh, how did you know about this? How'd you know about that? Sure. Let's talk about it. And everybody was just so, Oh, I found that consistently that everybody was so open. And I'm like sitting there going, my God, Richard Brooks, you've got three, you know, two Oscars and you're just sitting here in your chinos and your windbreaker talking about the professionals and you're not. Yeah. It was, I, I just always found that amazing and so cool. Why do you think that is? What do you think is the attitude that made them want to, is a communal, I assume maybe what you're saying is that it was like the work was important, but the ego itself was not important. Like they were clearly invested in what they were doing, but it was, you know, for them to welcome someone to, to just carry on a conversation with students or the people that were around the community. I feel like that's lost, right? Like that's, that seems uncommon now. I, I think, it, I think it is a little bit. And I, and honestly, I think one of the reasons is I remember when King Vidor used to lecture at SC and what a great old guy he was. I mean, he was just so much fun, but here's the thing. If he walked into a restaurant, he was just an old man. There was an anonymous factor to these people that, you know, yes, they're known in Hollywood and their favorite haunts and what have you. And, you know, if Robert Aldrich walked to a restaurant and he saw Lee Marvin or Charles Bronson, of course, they'd go and they'd talk to each other. But he was not Charles Bronson. He wasn't Lee Marvin. He was a man who was a very wealthy professional but he wasn't a public figure. I, I mean, to anyone, to the general public, you know, not to film buffs and people like that. And I think that that played an awful lot into it. That, you know, they, they had their lives and they were, you know, very privileged and some did extremely well. Others, you know, hit on hard times. But um, now, because of quite honestly, a lot of this stuff that we do with special features and highlights of uh, directors and, and what have you, um, it's like anybody who makes a movie suddenly has a spotlight shown on them, even if it's their first film. And there's that essence of celebrity because of websites and blogs and things like that. That didn't exist in the careers of these guys. Yeah. So they weren't exposed to that kind of ego stroking and in fact, if uh, their pictures showed up in the newspaper or something like that, that was really rare, unless you were Frank Capra, Alfred Hitchcock or something. Mm -hmm. You know, most people didn't even know what these guys looked like. Yeah. And now it's the internet has made everything so accessible. Yep. Something else I kind of want to ask you about, I'm abandoning my planet. Like I was going to try to go linearly, a little bit of a biography. I'm bailing on that. We'll just cover what we can cover <laughs> when we can. And then what we can't cover, we'll have you back. We'll talk about okay, it. Okay, wonderful. That sounds great. Um, but, you know, uh, one of the things, like, I have a lot of respect for you and your knowledge of, of I mean, all films across all genres, mm -hmm. but there's a lot You're of, you know, nice. when you get to a certain area of film fandom, like the, the commentaries and stuff like that, I mean, it's a lot of Westerns. It's a lot of horror. It's a lot of thrillers. You're on noir, you know. 
Mm-hmm. And, and those are sometimes the last, I, they're the last genres that newer movie fans, people who may be in their twenties or who are, you know, I've got a teenager and I would not want to be her growing up in this landscape where everything, you know, there's like, you know, 35, 40 movies on Netflix every single month that get dropped on you. And that's just on the one platform. There's such a huge, I don't know if I'm glut is the word that comes to mind, but that sounds almost demeaning, but there, there's a, there's such an influx of content. Do you think it's harder now for people to find and appreciate the kind of movies oh, that built what we, what we love? Absolutely. Because here's the thing when, when myself and Jeff and Darren and all of us made Whisper to a Scream. And uh, shortly after, in fact, even before the movie was done, I had already been signed on to, to write the movie Prison. This was at the time when VHS just had exploded. And the amount of money that was going into all these independent companies because all of these shelves and all these video stores had to be filled. And, you know, b- about three quarters of the movies actually played in movie theaters before they were sent to video cassette. Even the you know, things like Class of 1999 and those movies that that I was working on. But the thing was, then, you know, they would send cardboard standees and one sheets and, you know, Charlie Band, we had comic books and newsletters and all of these promotional items to set that product apart from everything else that was going to Blockbuster and Hollywood Video and all these different places. Now, it is something, a graphic the size of a postage stamp that goes along the bottom of your television screen. And, you know, it's like going, okay, wait a minute. All right, well, there's something with Michael Madsen and Frank Stallone next to Nicole Kidman and William Hurt and Michael Caine. And it's like, wait a minute, how did, that is not the way it used to be. I mean, there was a real division point between movies and everything was promoted individually Mm -hmm. so that audiences if you want to see your low budget action movie or you want to see your period melodrama you know you you had your distinct choices and they were presented to you in a distinct fashion that's just not the way it is anymore it's like this giant stew and you're kind of you know going through the liquid to find you know the hunk of beef or whatever it is you might be looking for it's so hard to find things now. And I mean, things come out. I love this stuff, right? I cover this stuff as part of my profession here on YouTube. And there's things that I don't even know about. Somebody will be like, hey, did you see so-and-so? I'll be like, I've never heard of it. I didn't even know it was out. Um, do you, so with your history, I mean, Transfers 3, uh, Class oh, of 1999. Yeah. Is your stuff accessible? Like, do you, if people wanted to just go stream your stuff, I'm leading into a conversation about physical media with you, but like, is, is your stuff digitally accessible? Yes. And yeah, I would, okay, here's the weenie answer yes and no. Um, I've done, uh, I was actually visiting uh, some relatives recently and they said, oh, Cordy, let's, let's, you know, uh, uh, search you on uh, Roku or whatever it was. And about five movies showed up. But this is the thing, you know, sometimes it you're really at the mercy of has the library been sold or not? Because I've done a lot of movies with the same people multiple times. Mm-hmm. I think I did six movies with Mark Lester, for example. Mm-hmm. And now they were for different production companies. But like with Charlie Band, that was, you know, whether it was All Full Moon or Empire, or whatever. But those things then get sold en masse to one network or another. Uh, Prison, for example, which was Empire, got sold to MGM. And that's been on the MGM HD channel for years. Uh, but then other stuff I did over there, uh-uh, you know, you, you can't find it. And so uh, having, you know, everything there, streaming, whatever, that's kind of a myth because, again, whatever work we've done, ends up being part of a catalog and where does that catalog end up? Right. And sometimes they hold things back and other times they, you know, they let things go and there's just no consistency unless, you know, you, you know, made something gigantic or a Marvel movie or something, you know, <laughs> well, and even which then, I never but, have, obviously. No, yet. Not yet. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so that's something else I want to talk to you about. Are you, okay. Oh, there's like seven different directions, Courtney. Um, let me stick with this one. Okay, so 
given your history, I mean, going back to the video era, right? You were mm -hmm. you're right here front and center. You had all these opportunities that were presented to you. It was the golden age of the video store, you know, Charlie Band. First of all, what was it like to work with Charlie Band? You, Albert Band, too, I assume. Did you work with him as well? I loved Albert. Uh, I We first met, of course, when uh, Irwin Ublanz had made the deal with Empire Pictures to distribute and uh, put money into prison. And we were given pretty rarefied status because the film had a higher budget and kind of a different pedigree than a lot of the other things Charlie was doing. And it, it, we did not originate with the company just like Reanimator hadn't. So we were kind of on that, you know, given that same uh, treatment pretty much. Of course, Reanimator ended up being, you know, this classic for them and it did, you know, just extraordinarily well. Uh, but that was when I first met uh, Charlie and Albert, and I loved Albert Band. He was just the greatest guy. And when we were making prison, Rennie Harlan and I were living together. We were renting a house together up in the Hollywood Hills. And so we were around, you know, we, were, we had finished the movie and it was being cut. And of course, you know, there was all the rumors about Rennie going on to a nightmare on Elm Street and all that stuff. But Albert Band, here, here was the thing with me and Albert. I, you know, there he had done Ghoulies too, and he had done these things with his son and whatever. That wasn't, you know, I would sit down with Albert Band. The guy was the associate producer on the Asphalt Jungle. He wrote, you know, the screenplay for John Huston's Red Badge of Courage. That was the Albert Band that I like talking about. I'm like, oh my God, tell me about the Western you did with Robert Ryan and Alex Cord, A Minute to Pray, A Second to Die, which I love. And so I think he appreciated the fact that I, I knew about who he was beyond the empire and the full moon world. Yeah. But he was, he of course, he and Charlie were very, very close. So close. And uh, Albert wanted to be in business with his son. And Charlie wanted to be in business with his dad. So that was, of course, the focus was the current thing, not something from 30 years ago. Right. And uh, those and when I worked with Albert and of course, he he produced and co-directed Dr. Mordred. He actually directed more of it than Charlie did. Uh, and then Albert produced Trancers. And uh, so I owed, uh, Albert kind of saw me a little bit of his, as his protege. And uh, I, I owed him a, a great deal. He, he was a terrific guy. I just loved him. And I've always been very, very fond of Charlie. I've never had a conflict with Charlie. I mean, yes, we all went through, you know, some of the crazy financial stuff. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I'm owed no money. I'm owed, you know, I don't have any ill will. And here's really the thing. At that time, the B-movie companies, and there were a lot of them, and it was all for the direct of VHS. But if you got in there, as I did as a writer, and I got in with Charlie because I had written the screenplay to prison, and even I was working for other people as well. But if you got into a company like that, the opportunity to direct would present itself if you, know, you hung in there and you wrote scripts. And that's really what I was doing. When Charlie, I had already done class of 1999 and full moon empire was gone. Full moon had, had reinvented itself. And a friend of mine was going down uh, to the office to audition for, it could have even been transfers too. I can't, I can't, honestly, I can't remember. And I went down with him and I hadn't seen Charlie and Albert in a couple of years. And we had this great reunion in the hallway and uh, they knew what I had been doing because class of 1999 had come out and there were billboards on Sunset and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, for a little, you know, octane picture, it was doing pretty good. And so uh, about three or four weeks later, Charlie asked me to come down to the set of Trancers 2. And I'd already made a movie with Tim Thomerson. So it was great to see Tim. And we had our reconnection there. And then Charlie offered me three movies to write, right in a row. Uh, Puppet Master 3, Dr. Mordred, and what he, we didn't know what the third one was going to be, but he kind of suggested it would be Trancers. And 
Puppet 3 and Dr. Mordred, you know, they turned out well and Paramount was very pleased with them, uh, thankfully. And that's when the subject of me doing transfers came up. But uh, Charlie was so busy running the company. And I don't know how he made any movies, quite honestly, during that period, because he was just, you know, doing a thousand things at once. And Tim Thomerson stepped up and said, give Courtney this shot. I'll support him completely. It really was, it was Tim and Albert. They, they backed me 1 billion percent. And with my God, with those two guys, I had the ultimate safety net. If I started to screw up, you know, uh, you know, Tim was there to support me. Albert was there to take over. So it was, you know, uh, everybody had confidence and it was wonderful, but it was the opportunity that came up because I was already within the company and I was kind of being promoted from inside. So there you go. Well, what do you, how were you, what was your experience like directing? Was it a good experience? Do you think? You oh God, it was fantastic. I always had wanted to, and you know, I've been making super eight movies and all that type of stuff, but um, one, I'll never forget. This was, this was so cool. Uh, we were shooting uh, Dr. Mordred. And the thing was because Paramount was distributing full moons stuff, we were in pretty big studios at the time. Charlie's own, he hadn't yet moved into the stages in Glendale, which was the old Aaron Spelling stages. So we were shooting, we actually did uh, transfers at Steve Cannell's studio where they had done Hunter. So, and you know, Paramount was financing and everything. And when we were on uh, Dr. Mordred, I was there and uh, Jeff Combs is, you know, just, just one of the all-time aces. And uh, they were shooting a scene and Albert turned to me and he said, okay, what's the next shot? And I said, I said, well, I think it probably ought to be this. It was very simple. It was like, it should be a close up and a reverse, you know, on who the other actor was. And he wanted me to kind of step in, get to know Adolfo Bartoli, who was the DP, get familiar with the crew. Cause this was Every, I was going to inherit absolutely everyone who was on Dr. Mordred onto transfers. So he wanted my familiarity and all of that stuff with everyone. So they really made sure about that and that there was this comfort level before I ever started. However, <laughs> on the very first day, and we were shooting in a place called the Ice House on Santa Monica Boulevard. It was a nightclub. And it was an interior of a club with strippers and stuff. And there's this big fight and everything. And uh, anyway, I drive in in my little Mazda and I get out. I've got my clipboard and my notes and my script. And I'm feeling very, you know, oh, this is great. I'm, you know, Gordon Douglas on the set of General Spanky, you know. And he directed his first movie, I wish. Anyway, <laughs> I'm walking in and this guy goes, oh, hi. Uh, yes, you go over here. I go, oh, okay. Now I had scouted the location and there were, you know, full bangers and you know, dressing rooms and everything. And uh, Greg Nicotero was so incredibly generous because K&B came in and did all the makeup effects for that movie as a favor to me because I've known Greg since he was like 10 years old. So I go in to where this guy told me to sit down. It was the extras bullpen. Oh, and I'm kind of sitting there for a few seconds. And uh, what was following me is a, a good friend of mine had volunteered to be an extra and I didn't know it. And he like goes, Courtney, what are you doing here? And I go, oh, well, hey, this is great to see. He goes, no, we're extras. Aren't you directing the movie? And I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> I told him, I said, wait a minute, I think I'm the director. And he, and he was very apologetic. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry, you were wandering around like you didn't know what you were doing. So I thought you were an extra. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there you go. Yes. But uh, I got my footing the streets a and little better in the them. Them. Yes. <laughs> uh, so. Do you think that that style of movie making, I mean, I don't, I don't think they make movies like that anymore. Do you think that's ever coming yeah. back? Well, you know, the thing was, those kinds of pictures, the series things that existed in these companies, um, no, because it really was, uh, it was like directing an episode of a television show mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. I mean, it was more elaborate, but uh, it was a continuation. And uh, here's, here is one thing that was the great advantage of doing movies like that for companies like whether you were at Full Moon or Transworld Entertainment or wherever it was. 
if you got an assignment to make a movie, the reality was that movie was going to get made whether you wrote it or not, whether you directed it or not. If it wasn't you, it was the guy or the young woman standing right behind you. So, you know, you kind of grab what opportunities you could get. Again, I'm talking about, you know, things where you're asked to do or assignments where you're asked to do it as opposed to initiating something yourself, which right. is an entirely different situation. But um, no, I, I, you know, Heath, we, we think about this and then it's like, well, wait a minute. Bloomhouse has done 10 sequels to a movie, you know, that they just, start, and, you know, here comes another, uh, you know, here comes the nun four and here comes, you know, so all that stuff still, the franchise stuff, I think is probably more important now than it used to be, but it is certainly done on such a much larger scale than what we used to do. You know, there was, I remember, when uh, or after after Basic Instinct and Andrew Stevens and you know all these guys were all doing uh, quote unquote erotic thrillers, and so whether it was you know Roger Corman Strip to Kill you know or uh, Cat Shape directing whatever it might be so okay you've got violence and a lot of nudity and there you go and usually B movie names all right what was the difference between that and what Carol Co. and those guys were doing for 40 million bucks or more? Mm -hmm. The answer is quite honestly, nothing. Yeah. And if if you had just ripped that front uh, you know, page of the script off, so it didn't say, you know, written by Courtney from a story by Andrew Stevens or something. And then you said, oh, it could, it could have been any super high-end studio, quote-unquote, erotic thriller from that period. So I think that was also very true, is that the B pictures that we were doing, generally they were aping something that was very large. But at the same time, so the only difference really at, at certain times was the amount of money that was spent, because what was written on the pages was very close to, uh, you know, the uh if you will the rich cousins well they, they weren't micro budget either the what was what was <laughs> lower budget for what you know charles band stuff or corman stuff i mean it was low budget but it wasn't like now where it's like okay you have twenty thousand dollars or some no. ridiculously low it was bigger than that well you know i get it i get asked you know sometimes who've done some some of these films for very little money and they look at some of the old movies we were making then and they go, what, what is the difference? We're perceiving something and forgetting about, you know, the money that was spent. And I am absolutely not a digital snob at all, mm -hmm. but I do think that there is kind of a mental perception about film and the way it registers in your brain versus its digital counterpart. And we were shooting these movies on film. We were shooting them with Panavision equipment. It was 35 millimeter. And also, you know, and, and now, my gosh, if you want to make a movie, if you really have the desire to make a film, you can do it with your phone. And your editing software is on your laptop and all this stuff. When, you know, we wanted to make a movie in 1982 or 83, and we're trying to get independent finance together, you know, we had to have... 150 or 200 thousand dollars just to start because if nothing else we had to have film negative prints you know mixing all that stuff and a crew and you know it's it was a whole different thing i mean even at the smallest level i i want to say this right you were making a real movie, if that makes it. I mean, that sounds terrible. And, you know, I, I, I apologize because I think I might have just destroyed your site. Uh, this no. comment. But it, it was, if you were closer to what we believed Hollywood filmmaking was than the way things are now, where everything is so portable and so basically invisible and you can do things so under cover that, uh, you know, in those days, I mean, my God, even just a you know, you're shooting out at Bronson Canyon and it was some, you know, topless girl being chased by a guy in a gorilla suit. 
you had to get a permit for that from the city, you know, and, you know, I mean, somebody try and steal stuff, which we used to always do, but you know what I'm saying? It was not, um, uh, it wasn't out of the hip pocket nearly as much as it is now. And quite honestly, now what a great advantage, uh, you know, I I wanted to to try and direct a movie, but I had to wait for to work my way to a point where someone would give me the opportunity to do it, as opposed to being able just to walk out the door and decide what I wanted to do and pull it together and do it, which I think now is certainly a lot more available than it used to be. But the sense of scope is lost because what you're talking. I think about, so. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I agree with you. I think that film has film is it's a magic. And and I also realize that for the young, there's a younger generation that does not care. They're happy to watch a movie on their phone. Oh um, yeah. So I don't know. It's an old guard versus a new guard thing. But for me, I mean, we, I, I love what you're talking about. Did you ever have to use uh, short ends for film? Did you ever have to resort? Oh, to sure. Film? We use short ends on from a whisper to a scream. And, uh, that was very, you know, that was very, that was one of the great cost saving things is, you know, you go to photo chem and, you know, it's, uh, and at times God had a buddy he was putting together a feature and shooting it on the weekends with short ends. And he would get very excited because he says, oh, you wouldn't believe it. I just got their short ends from Turner and Hooch or something. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's so cool. They would use that film. Yeah. Yeah. I think. I did something with, I, I got to interview Fred Olin Ray a while back. I think he said that he had used some short ends on like multiple movies because you can save so much money by doing save that. Save so much money. And of course, when Fred, I mean, he was really starting also in the regional things way back when, when he was doing those first movies in Florida and 16 and all that stuff. And, you know, but the opportunity was there too. And it was, I remember one time uh, I was helping Charlie Band uh, he was doing an auction of a lot of the original artwork of the full moon posters and stuff like that. And I was helping him write the catalog. And it was great because I got to go with him to the warehouse and we were going through all this stuff. And it was really, it was really neat. But afterwards, Charlie actually gave me a ride home and he came up and sat in my apartment for a couple of hours. And we had the longest conversation we'd ever had. And Albert, Albert had passed away. And Charlie got very nostalgic about those first days starting out when you would run around to regional theaters with a print in the trunk of your car to try and get it played in this drive-in in Iowa or that, you know, that hard top theater in, you know, downtown Detroit or wherever it was. And that it was more, if you will, almost like a carnival atmosphere and feel for, you know, whether it was Charlie or, you know, Al Adamson and Sam Sherman or whoever it might be. And, Fred uh, and I think that, yeah, that was, I mean, and I think they were having, of course they're young guys, but they were having fun and they were doing what they wanted to do. They were, you know, making movies.